So as we already talked about today, they're starting a, a movement today. And if we're going to start a movement, we need to understand what we're up against. And I'm a storyteller. I use data to do this. And today I'm telling a story of how we got into the inequal situation that we are in today. So in Germany, and I have to apologize, I'm focusing on a relatively privileged group. It's not very intersectional, but I was told I only had seven minutes. So <laughs> we're going to do the short version, but I'm always happy to talk more about this in the future. So in Germany here, we start our career paths in university at a relatively equal rate. We have 50-50 to people who are graduating from... Um, okay. <laughs> um, we have relatively equal numbers in who completes a bachelor's degree here in Germany. Um, and as we enter the workforce, we see that Germany is the 12th best place for women to work um, in the OECD, which sounds like it's pretty good. But at the same time, Germany has a 17.1% gender pay gap, meaning women earn on average 17.1% less than men. And if we look at the data, and that's actually 3% worse than the OECD average. And if we look at the data, we can see some trends that have brought us into this area. So um, women are relatively well employed in Germany but we are also very part-time employed in Germany. And I am not against part-time employment. I myself do not work full-time by choice. Um, but at the same time, this, we, this sets us up for inequalities that sort of have consequences for us further on in the career path. Um, and if we look at careers dominated by women and sectors dominated by women, we see that this part-time career path has sort of continues through this um, area. So it's not just a career thing, it's not just an industry thing, it's a woman thing. And part of this, and people say part-time work is really great because you can have more of a life balance and you can balance kids and all these things. Um, but the inequality happens because men aren't taking advantage of this uh, work-life balance program themselves. So what happens is that you then have this growing gap where men have more experience, men have more pay, men are seen as more valuable employees, and women are put in the disadvantage. We have this Mutti Ecke in Germany. Um, and this becomes even more apparent when you look at well, the top ranks of where women are employed in um, Germany and where when you look at the percentage of women in leadership in companies, you see that we're very well misrepresented in this thing, especially when you look at the sector of companies from 50 to 500, which is this really important economic sector in Germany. These are the Mittelstand companies that are sort of seen as the bread and butter of our economy. Um, we see the worst representation for women in this area. And part of that is because we are private sector, Mittelstand are technically private um, sector companies. They're not publicly traded and therefore not subject to the um, quotas that are in place, but even the quotas in Germany are quite weak as they are only for board representations and not for technically leadership in companies. Um, and of course, this part-time thing also means that women are busier at home. So this sort of leads to a general inequality of what it is. And in Germany, women report spending twice as much time working in the home as men. And I would also like to point out that there are many studies that say men tend to over-report the amount of housework that they do. So <laughs> take this with a grain of salt. So what can we do about this thing? So if we look at data, we also don't just see the problems, we also see solutions. Um, this year, Germany celebrated, or I guess last year, Germany celebrated 100 years of um, voting rights for women. And along with those 100 years of voting rights for women, women also have celebrated in January 100 years of being able to be elected in Germany. So as we, when we talk about voting rights, it's just as important to talk about electability rights. So for Krupp Reporter this year, our company did a project where we looked at, oops, yeah, um, where we looked at the female representation in every German government since 1919, and we broke it down by party. Um, what we found was that in the first years, 1919 and 1920, we actually had almost 10% representation. And after the Third Reich, the Nazi era, where women were locked out of upper er um, eras of party, it took Germany until 1988 to get back to that number. So there was a really backlash of conservatism that sort of came after the war, especially in the West. Um, but in the DDR, we had great representations, but that also wasn't a democratic system. So you could technically argue that democracy isn't good for women, but um, 
I would also argue that those parties were not where the power was in that case. Um, where we did see a big jump was actually in the, DD, or in the, G, in the West Germany um, in 1987. And that was the year that the Greens joined the political landscape. And what the Greens did from the beginning is that they had a candidate quota. They said that 50% of the candidates we were going to run were going to be women. And this created a huge spike, and you can sort of see it coming out of there, um, of the number of women who were elected in government. The SPD, oops. The SPD said this is a great idea, and they decided to do it too, but they had less balls about it, and they decided to run only a third 30% candidate quota. Um, but since then, we've seen a big jump in the number of women represented, although those are still the only two parties that have done it. But there are other governments, other parties, that have been much more bold in their quota systems, and there is real results that we can see in data of what these quota things bring. And that's the public sector, and so if we can actually bring real change into private sector, into leadership, um, we can actually sort of see the benefit of quotas. Women also need more transparency. Um, so when we talk about the gender pay gap, a lot of the problem is that we don't actually know what our male counterparts are owning. Germany has a transparency law, but it's very obscure. You need to have 50 people in your company, and you need to be able to list six men in your position so that you can get an average quote of what they're earning in order for you to do it. I work in a company with 50 people, but I cannot do this because I am the only person in my position there. So I don't know what my male counterparts are earning, and I have no right to ask because the laws are very obscure. In Denmark, they have um, a Harvard study showed that um, they're much more open about it. So companies with 50 people have to report how much men earn, how much women earn. And they found that mandatory reporting firms had a 17.5% pay gap versus non-mandatory reporting firms that stayed steady at 18.9%. The decrease happened in seven years, and they found that what was actually changing was not that women were getting a whole bunch of money, but men were earning slowly more money. So the men were getting smaller raises, whereas the women were getting more raises. So by having sort of this transparency, women could better benchmark themselves as to what they should be earning and also better value their work. Um, and finally, women need gender neutral data. Data is collected by algorithms. Algorithms are programmed by engineers. Engineers are dominated by the male industry, by men. Um, so there's sort of an inherent bias in the programming that happens. And when we have non-gender neutral data, we also get non-gender non neutral data representations. For example, this one, which I took from a German government website. And I have to say, ladies, apparently we are all um, Mary. The mother of Jesus, because only women have children and men do not. So, in this kind of, this was taken from a um, from the family ministry, and it was talking about sort of the important life steps that people take in their careers that affect their earnability, and ch women. It was noted that children was on the list, but men as fathers are not considered, um, yeah, this isn't a metric that they measure. So, um, yeah, so it's really important to have gender neutral data. It's important that men and women are represented equally as parents as well as valuable employees because that's how we value each other. Um, data is constantly being used in more decision making today. So it's incredibly important that the data that we put in the hands of decision makers represents the decisions that need to be made. So that's what we're up against, and I think we have a full program of um, people who are going to give us some tools, tricks, and skills that will push us forward, and I'm looking forward to it. Thank you so much for your attention.